Anything else? There's more of you here than I thought there would be with the weather outside. <laughs> All right, let's begin with the confession and forgiveness. Let's stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. The gathering song is in your green hymnal, 559, 559, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing. <laughs> reading in the book. A reading from Nehemiah. 
When the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the women, men and the women, and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Reza, the priest and scribe, then the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. The heavens declared the glory of God, and the sky proclaimed its marker handwork. One day the challenges fail to another, and one man can crush knowledge to another. All three of they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the end of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom room out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of its end. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and lies the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives Wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures for forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and Right. Uh, um, um, together. More to be desired are than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the home. By them also is your servant and invited. And in keeping them there is great reward. Who can exact one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above the keep your servant from presumptuous presumptuous signs. Let them not get demand. Dominion over me. Then shall I be full and sound and in innocent. innocent of a great offense. 
Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Excellent. Thank you very much. <coughs> Second reading is from 1 Corinthians. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. <coughs> if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the great honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. The word of the Lord. I'm going to invite the kids to come up for a little bit. So, what was Teresa just talking about in her when she was reading? Did you hear? Body parts, right? There's a lot of body parts, you know, Teresa had to read. So, I found this book, and um, so this is a body, right? And what do we see in this body? What is it showing us? Bones, right? That's the skeletal system, right? So that's one part of our body. And then we turn the page, and now we're looking at what? Okay, yeah. Muscles, right? Yeah. And then here's a heart. So inside us, part of our circulatory system, right? We got all our veins. When I was a kid, we had something called encyclopedias, and the coolest page in the entire encyclopedia was in the H edition, and it was the human body, and all of these pictures were on clear paper, and you could just lay them one on top of the other. It was so cool, but I didn't find anybody who had one of those. <laughs> right? So there's all these parts of our body. We have bones, we have muscles, and ligaments, and tendons, and lungs and hearts and veins, right? That all makes part of our body. Ligaments are things that hold our bones together. Okay? So what happens, like, what would happen to the body if we didn't have skin? Yeah, we just kind of, I don't know, we just kind of, yeah, we just kind of be a pile, I think, if we didn't have skin. Right? Well, there would be anything to wrap us all together, right? It would just got a tape. Yeah, it's kind of like wrapping paper, I think skin is, right? Holds it all together, right? 
And sometimes, sometimes our bodies don't work perfectly, right? Like my eyes don't work perfectly, I wear glasses, right? Sometimes we have to fix parts of our body, like our hips, right? But we do all those kind of things um, to make our body function as best as it can, but nobody has a perfect body. And what Teresa was talking about, when she was talking about all those body parts, she was talking about the church. The church is like body parts. Um, you know, that all of us together have to have to work together to be I the church. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we have to work work together, but we're not perfect. Um, but we do the best that we can to function function well together. So let's pray. Dear God, we are thankful for the bodies that you give us um, and all of the intricate pieces that go together to make us who we are. Help us to stay healthy and fit um, and help us to work with one another as the body of Christ that is your church. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up. probably could have found an encyclopedia if I thought about it before 6 o'clock last night. Why don't you stand for gospel reading? The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled. In your hearing, the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. It's been quite the week for my brain. I started off with a retreat at Menegoshi Ministries with other regional pastors just to talk about ministry. When we checked into our rooms, there was a sign posted on each participant's door that read, The Gathering of Area Church Leaders to Solve All Problems, Present and Future. T-G-O-A-C-L-T-S-A-P-P-A-F for short or maybe just a good conversation about how to be good Jesus followers and good leaders in his church right now. Centered around scripture and prayer, our conversation was life-giving as we shared struggles and visions, disappointments and dreams. Swirling in my head are concepts about the church in four stages of searching for God, pilgrim, settler, exile, and nomad. You'll probably hear more about that down the road in future sermons. We also talked about weekly worship being the huddle, but the game, the big event, unfolds during the other six days. So maybe we're spending too much time focusing on the huddle and not on the game. Then on Wednesday, I began a six-week Zoom book study that's being offered through the Western North Dakota Synod. We're reading and discussing how to lead 
When You Don't Know Where You're Going by Susan Beaumont. And at least the initial chapters seem to speak well into this uncertain time for the church that's been exacerbated by COVID response and reaction, as well as continued divisions throughout our country on political, social, and economic issues. Due to a variety of things happening in addition to that, it was much later in the week than normal when I started to study the scripture text assigned today. So I thought I'd just focus in on the gospel reading. And then my eye wandered to the reading from 1 Corinthians. And then I remembered the little toe. During my first summer on Bible camp staff at Upper Missouri Ministries near, near Epping, this reading from 1 Corinthians 12 was part of our Bible study for campers each week. And as in all things Bible camp, there must be a skit. And you guessed it, this one was called Little Toe. You probably imagine how it plays out. Camp counselors representing different body parts come out and proclaim their greatness and their importance. The heart that pumps blood through the circulatory system, the lungs that fill us with breath, the brain with great and lofty ideas, the legs that provide lift and ambulation. They're all very excited about their contributions to the human body. Then enters another body part. Who are you? The others ask. I'm the little toe, is the enthusiastic response. And the belittlement begins about how insignificant and unimportant the little toe is in comparison to the larger body parts. And the little toe becomes sad because they're little, no one gives them any respect. Often out of sight, they're even forgotten. Plus, there is a much bigger system that controls them. Then one part mentions the purpose of the pinky toe is to provide balance and propulsion. So not only does the little toe keep us from getting kind of lopsided, it helps us to push off to the next step and keep us moving. The conclusion of the skit is that all the body parts realize they have an important role to play in the function of the human body. Paul uses very similar, a very similar analogy to address issues in the early church in Corinth. Because for almost as long as there's been a church, there have been disagreements and dissensions among its members. The primary concern that Paul is trying to tackle in this letter is the division between the followers of Jesus who came from the Jewish tradition and those who've come to believe in the good news of Jesus' saving and redeeming work who are referred to in this passage as Greeks. In other Bible locations, um, they're termed Gentiles or even pagans. And these are catch-all phrases to refer to anyone who wasn't of the Jewish tradition. It's the classic human pitfall. Thinking that we are better than others for whatever reason. So Paul seeks to level the playing field. Paul locates the Christian's identity where it properly belongs, in our baptism. He insists the Spirit unites all who are baptized in Jesus Christ. In verse 12, we hear multiple use of words like all and one. Paul goes on to say we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews, Greeks, slaves, or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Of course, people's race, gender, age, sexual and political orientation, as well as socioeconomic status, all help to make up part of who we are. But unity does not equal sameness and homogeneity. Perhaps, especially in 21st century North America, including its Christians. There seems to be an increasing link to our identity to one or more of those characteristics. 
but Paul centers our, centers our identity in baptism. We are not, first of all, American, Canadian, or any other nationalities Christians. We are baptized Christians. The apostles, apostle insists that Jesus Christ's followers are not, first of all, Reformed or Anglican, Roman Catholic, or Orthodox Christians. We are baptized Christians. So often we focus on what divides us rather than what unifies us. Today and next Sunday are the annual meetings of our congregations, when we'll talk about our plan for the coming year and how we will live out our lives as Christians together here in this place and in this time. As small rural congregations, we are well aware of the fact that it takes a collective effort among all of our members to carry out God's mission in and for the world. When members move away or die or simply choose to participate in the life of the church less than they used to, we feel that impact sharply. It's easy to feel defeated sometimes. There just aren't enough of us anymore. Things aren't the way they used to be. We worry about finances and building up keep and banners and communion supplies, which are all legitimate concerns. Yet Paul points out that we are blessed with a variety of gifts and talents that are useful to do the work that God wants us to do. When the church began, there were 12 guys. And somehow, they managed to spread the good news of Jesus Christ across the globe. They proclaimed Christ crucified and risen, ever expanding the circle of those who experienced the love of God through Jesus. And I can guarantee that things didn't always go smoothly. But they persevered in creating one faith-filled community after another, following in the ways of Jesus. Our topic for confirmation this week was church. What's that? And our discussion centered on what we mean when we use the word church. We talked about a building, a gathering for worshipers, and organizations like individual congregations and denominations. But ultimately, we talked about the church as the people, the body of Christ who are joined together because we follow Jesus. Because remember, Jesus never asked us to worship him. Jesus asked us to follow him. Paul reminds us that all who follow Jesus, all who believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, have been bestowed with gifts that can help the world. There is a great diversity in what we have to offer, but together we are the church. Or in the words of the Lutheran songwriter Jay Beach, we are the church, the body of our Lord. We are all God's children, and we have been restored. Amen. Let's stand for the hymn of the day, Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. <coughs>
our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with the prayers of the church. I'll end the petition. God of grace, you can respond. Hear our prayer. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. You reveal yourself to us in the reading of Scripture. Fulfill your word through the faithful witness of your church. Send us out to bring your liberating good news to all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. All creation proclaims your handiwork. Teach us to love the intricate and beautiful bodies that you have created. Bless tiny insects, enormous whales, and every creature in, belief, in between. Sustain species at risk of extinction. God of grace, you desire that there be no dissension among us. Where we are divided in our society, nation, or world, come quickly to reuni reunite us into one body. Ease conflict, dispel violence, and bring an end to war. God of grace. Anoint with your spirit all who seek your favor. Grant provision and justice for people living in poverty, people living with disability, those living with pain, or those living under oppression, all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, especially those on our prayer list and those we name now in our hearts. God of grace, build up the body of Christ in this place. Bless the varieties of ministry in our congregation, Empower us to freely welcome and deeply value each person who enters into worship and ministry among us. God of grace. In thanksgiving, we lift before you the saints for whom the promise of salvation has now been fulfilled. Tend to those who mourn. Bring us together in your everlasting glory. God of grace. Since we have such hope in, in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. And the peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a, a sign of Christ's peace with one another as you are comfortable.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered together by the power of the Holy Spirit, let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. During this season of Epiphany, we are learning a new communion song in this feast of love.
May the body and blood of our incarnate Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let's pray together the prayer after communion. We give you thanks, gracious God. We have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. These are blue hymnals for our sending song, 723, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve. 